This is part five in a series of videos in which I'm attempting to repair this PDP 11-3. This is part of a CNC machine, but I only have um, the actual PDP part of it. I don't have the console, the interface, the tape reader, uh, or the CNC hardware itself. So very difficult to repair um, a machine like this when I only have parts of it. As I've shown in previous videos, uh, there are a lot of connections to this particular con controller. There are also a couple of custom interface cards at the bottom of this rack, so it makes testing um, a machine like this very challenging. And in the previous videos, I've shown some of the basic fault finding that I do. I haven't gone into too much detail. In the previous video, I showed the general approach I take to looking for faults in the hardware. Um, but if you've ever worked on this sort of machine, you'll know that working on them is a combination between looking at the firmware, so you know what they're supposed to be doing, and um, looking at the actual hardware to see if there are any faults and making sure that the two are working correctly together as they should. Very difficult on a machine like this that has so many interconnections, uh, but the basic principles are the same. In the previous video I was looking at a fault trying to get the tape reader interface to work, that's the punch tape reader, and um, I went through showing various uh, faulty ICs that I'd found. I haven't gone into too much detail with this machine, I found quite a few faults um, on this machine on various cards, from a uh, fault on the RAM card, uh, several faults on the in-out cards, several faults on the interface cards, um, but getting fairly close now to the point where it will be time to send it back to the owner so he can try it in the CNC environment and see what it does. Um, but before I do that I wanted to do a bit more testing and I thought I'd go into a bit more detail as to how I go about some of that testing in this video. Before I start I just wanted to address a couple of questions that came up as a result of the previous videos. Um, the first one is somebody asked me if I thought that TTL devices were unreliable because I seem to change a lot of them. And uh, the answer is no, I don't think they're particularly unreliable. In fact, I think they're extremely reliable. I do, however, change over a thousand a year, but that's only because at any one time I'm working on maybe five or six different machines and uh, each one of those may have up to a thousand TTL devices in it, so it's inevitable that I'll uh, encounter quite a few failed devices. Uh, but in general they're very reliable. Um, and again, bear in mind a lot, of, a lot of the machines I work on are maybe 50 years old, so it's not that surprising that um, they do contain a number of failed devices. And also a lot of the machines I end up repairing have gone through several hands trying to get them working, uh, and quite often a lot of the failures are possibly as a result of that. Um, it's hard to say, but um, as I say, I don't think they're particularly unreliable devices. One other point I'd make is that I've shown that I found a few faulty components in the previous video, and in other videos I've said that uh, ICs don't always fail. Uh, sometimes they just don't work quite as well as they should. And that's one thing that's always worth bearing in mind when you're testing a machine like this and the interaction between the devices can cause some fairly subtle problems. Um, now I didn't mention it in the previous video but the 7404 that I replaced actually tests good in all my testers. So if we take a basic IC tester and I select the correct IC, so it's a 74LS04 I put the IC in, press test, and as you can see it tests OK. So we'll try the same device in a more expensive tester. So we'll try the ABI unit, a much more expensive tester, put the device into it, press test, but again it passes. So it's passing a test, the only um, tester I have that would detect this as being faulty is the logic comparator. Uh, the logic analyzer would also probably show this as working so um, in terms of the best way to go about testing 
at this level then really the scope is the way to go because you can see uh, the signals going into and coming out of devices. So uh, in this case it was clearly not working. I showed in the video that uh, the output wasn't switching and the input um, wasn't really able to control the output. But I was using a resistor in series with my test lead. That was the lead I was feeding the or controlling the input signal with. And the reason I use a resistor is because it will pick up faults like that. So it was requiring too much current on the input to uh, control the device and so it wasn't working within the machine because it wasn't being fed with enough current to cause the output to switch. Testers like this and also the ABI drive or tend to overdrive the inputs so they put a lot of current on the input and that overcame the uh, failure mode of this particular device. Uh, other devices, um, I found a faulty 74175 on the interface card, so if we test that. Okay, so with the other device, if we take the tester, I've got it set to 74175. We'll put the suspected failed 74175 in there, run the test, and as you can see, this one fails the test every time. So. Um, sometimes the testers will pick them up, other times uh, they won't, so just be aware of that. Um, they're reliable devices but on machines like this there will be failures and especially because there's not a lot of buffering on these machines between uh, each card so if you get a fault on one card it can quite often damage other cards and that's what I found with this machine there's been a lot of uh, commonality on the faults so um, particular devices that are attached to a particular bit on the back plane have all failed. So um, you get kind of a cascade failure, but in general they're reliable, but sometimes you do need a scope to actually see the failures. Okay, the second question relates to the use of trap instructions in the PDP environment. And um, although they're quite easy to understand, if you read through the uh, software documentation for the PDP you almost have to know how they work to be able to make sense of it so I'll go through the um, trap uh, code or the, the instruction fairly briefly here I won't go into too much detail I'll just uh, generally speaking explain how it works um, and the easiest way is by example so if we take a fragment of code from um, the ROMs on this machine I've um, got a small fragment here if we start reading through it, it's not long before we encounter um, an in, a line like this, an instruction like this. It's saying trap 17. And um, the actual trap opcode is the 104. The 4 is because bit 8 is set, and there are two versions of the general purpose trap. There's a general purpose trap and there's the emulator trap. And the way this works is when you invoke this instruction, it causes the PDP to jump to uh, one of two vectors. If bit 8 is set, it will jump to address um, 34. If uh, bit 8 is clear, it will jump to address 30. And we'll look at why it does that in a few minutes. Now, one thing that tends to be a bit confusing with traps is that firstly, there are a number of different types of trap that jump to different vectors. So there's some specific um, trap functions that jump to different vectors. But here I'll stick to just the general purpose trap and in this particular case we'll assume we're jumping to the general purpose trap with bit 8 set. Uh, that's how it's most commonly used anyway. Um, what gets confusing is this number following the trap instruction is not really part of the opcode. It's just a, a, a clever mechanism that allows uh, the programmer to send a value to the uh, trap handler and it works a bit like a, an argument in a function call in that um, it's not used uh, anywhere except by the programmer we'll look at that in a few minutes so in this case this instruction will cause the PDP to do several things firstly it will uh, act a bit like an interrupt in that it will push the current program counter and the program status words onto the stack and that will include this value of 17 so although it's not used as part of the opcode it's not 
uh, interpreted by the CPU decoder, um, it will be on the stack for us to use later on. Once it's done that, it will vector to address 34. And um, in theory, the uh, software system would have to set up a vector at that address. We'll have a look at that in a few minutes. Um, but what should happen from that point on is it should jump to a trap handler. Now in this case, I've located the uh, code that handles the general purpose trap in this uh, set of ROMs. So we'll have a look at that now. So I've printed this off and um, the construct here is, is quite straightforward. These invalid opcodes are nothing more than a list of addresses. Um, but the entry point for this handler is at this address of 7002. Now you have to kind of have an implicit one at the beginning of all these addresses because this is just um, uh, been decompiled without there being a base address set. But the base address for this uh, ROM card is at 1 uh, followed by 5 zeros. So in other words, you need to um, imagine there's a 1 at the beginning of all the addresses. And that's why there's a 1 at the beginning of uh, each address in this list. But the entry point is here. So the entry address is actually 107002. So we'll check later on. That's the address that should, in theory, be at address 34. Uh, we'll check that in a few minutes. And uh, what happens once we vector to this address is we do a little bit of um, housekeeping. We take off the stack the value that we uh, included with the trap instructions. In this case, it was 17. And we do that by simply um, popping the value off the stack. So R6 is the uh, stack pointer and we put the value into register R1 and we have to multiply the value by 2 and we do that by shifting it left and the reason we have to do that is because the trap numbers are incremental starting at 0 going through 1, 2, 3 etc uh, but of course the addresses are each 2 bytes long so we need to multiply the trap number by 2 uh, and what we then do is we effectively take this uh, base value of 106740 and we add to it the value in R1 and then we move that result into R7 and R7 is of course the program counter so it will jump to whatever address we load into it and if we look up here at the top of this table we'll see that we have a value here of um, 6740 and if we look down here we have 6740 as I said there's a 1 here but um, you have to remember there should be a 1 at the beginning of these addresses anyway so effectively um, if R1 is 0 then we are putting a value of 106740 into R7 in fact we're not putting that value in we're putting the value stored at that address into R7. That's what this instruction does. So in this case, we would put into R7 this value of 107230, and so um, the PDP would vector to that address. In this case, it would jump to 107230. If I go through to the next page, so 107230, Remember, there's an implicit one at the beginning of these. So 7230 is here, and there is a branch. So it will branch to the correct handler for that particular uh, vector. If there was a one um, after the trap instruction, then that would be multiplied by two, and we would then add two to this value. So that would be 106742. And if we come up here, we can see um, 6742 and so in this case the value 107210 would be put into R7 and again if we look for that address so we're looking for 7210 so we go back to the next page 7210 we can again see it's at the beginning of a block of fairly simple code that ends with a branch
and these all work the same. The, each of these is a jump. You can see each one ends with a branch. And that is because all that's happening here is depending on the value that's in R1, uh, we will put into the program counter one of these addresses and each one of these addresses relates to one of these blocks of code that uh, ends up with a branch at the end. So in other words, it's a lookup table. It allows us to vector the machine through the general purpose vector uh, starting at address 34 and that will then bring us up here and that in turn based on the number after the trap instruction will select one of the handlers by loading its address into the program counter and at the end of that um, we have this um, uh, RTI return from interrupt instruction and that will take us back to the calling code and it will uh, the PDP will unwind the, uh, the interrupt and um, continue from where it left off with the instruction after the trap. So that's how the trap works. It's fairly straightforward. What I'll do now is we'll just have a quick look uh, on the uh, terminal and we'll see what happens uh, down at uh, address 34 and see if we do indeed have the correct value at that address. Okay, so we're looking at the terminal. As you can see, I've booted up the PDP and it's gone through to its normal startup address. And uh, what we can do now is examine the uh, addresses starting at address 30. So if you recall, that's the address of the emulator um, trap vector. So in this case, it's zero. If we go through to 34, that has defaulted to four. So that's set by the PDP itself. It's not pointing at the address we want it to for our code, but then bear in mind, we haven't yet run the code in the ROMs. So if we now run the code in the ROMs, So part of starting up that code is, in theory, it should initialize the various vectors that it intends to use. So I'll break out of that code. We'll go back and look back at the addresses. So it hasn't modified address 30, but address 34 is 107002. And if you recall, that's the entry point for the trap handler that we looked at a few minutes ago. One other thing that um, happens with uh, this particular mechanism, if we look at the next um, value at 36, the trap instruction also loads the processor status word flags with uh, predefined values. That's to make sure that the processor is in the mode that the system wants it to be in. And then, of course, at the end of the uh, trap handler, it will um, pop the original values back into the program counter and the program and the processor status word. So that's how it works. It's uh, a very flexible mechanism. It allows the uh, ROM code or the software that's running to load any value it wants into address 34. Whenever a trap instruction is encountered, if it's a general purpose trap with bit 8 set, then it will vector to th address 34. And whatever value is at that address is where the program counter will then jump to. So that's how traps work. If you want any more detailed information on this sort of thing, then uh, leave a comment um, and I'll go into the uh, system in more detail. But uh, I'll try and keep the videos as uh, simple as I can. Um, what we'll do now is go back and investigate whether we uh, got the tape reader working. Okay, well, excuse the noise. The PDP is a very noisy machine. It's got a very noisy fan on it. Um, but what I've got set up here is uh, using one of the PIC demo boards I've shown previously. I've written some simple code to simulate the uh, paper tape reader. I've got it hooked up to the um, paper tape reader port. Uh, 
there's just eight connections for the data and one connection for the step. So a very simple reader this uses, it's just got a step input to it that causes the stepper motor to advance the paper tape and then um, it, after a short delay, reads the value from the tape and then it produces the next step pulse. Okay, so what I did with this is looked at the way that the uh, step pulse is being uh, generated and the um, PDP code does not directly control the uh, actual step pulse itself. So if we look back at the code for uh, driving the stepper motor then all it really does is it sets a bit in one of the uh, in out control cards and then after a short delay it clears the bit and then it uh, introduces another delay and then it reads the data in from the um, the port that the reader is connected to but this um, Pulse, the bit it's setting is not used to directly control the step output. Instead, what happens is on the falling edge of that bit, so that's when it clears the bit, the interface card at the bottom of the stack generates a 60, uh, 60 microsecond pulse, and on the falling edge of that pulse, the uh, reader steps the stepper motor. And it does this at uh, intervals of about 9.2 milliseconds, so it's about 110 board that it reads the um, tape at. So, in other words, what I determined from this is that the best point to set the data up on the um, data bus is uh, halfway between the setting of the bit and the clearing of the bit. So that's what this does. It monitors the very simple um, code in the PIC. This is just a, a series of tables uh, that contain the data that was on the paper tape. I don't have the paper tape, I just have the file that the owner read. And uh, he sent me a copy of it and uh, that was in binary form so I converted it into a form I could use in the PIC. And um, I then programmed that into the PIC it's in a series of ROM tables. Now in the PIC you can make larger single tables but I broke it into blocks so that I could have a series of LEDs that would show me the progress as it went through the uh, sending of the data. And the actual code to do that is extremely simple. Okay, so all it does is it uses a, uh, an index and that's the index into one of these uh, arrays, these data arrays. It sets the index to zero, sets the first LED on and then it sits and waits for the next high pulse from the uh, step uh, input to the what would be a tape reader. When it sees the high value, it loads the next data value from the array and then it waits for the pulse to go low, increments the index and loops around and it does that for all the bytes in that table. Now the first table is um, a specific length. Now what we determined from looking at the code is that the way that the system seems to operate is it appears as if though it loads a bootloader. So it uses this code which is part of a, the ROMs, so this code is from the, the ROMs, and it seems to want to load a limited size bootloader from a tape, and then at the end of that it seems to hand control to the bootloader, it's just loaded. And um, looking at the values in the code, uh, I determined that the length of the bootloader was 190 bytes but the first byte was the size of the bootloader so in other words it doesn't copy the first byte on tape that's just the number of uh, instructions in the bootloader that it intends to load uh, so once it's done that at this point um, the LED switches the first LED will switch off the next LED will switch on so that's these LEDs on the left here and um, the next 241 bytes will be sent, assuming that it's receiving step pulses. 
and it just repeats those little blocks uh, until it's sent all the data and then in theory the PDP should have copied all the data from the tape reader into RAM. Also determined um, by looking at the various uh, control lines that the switch that's connected to this port on the side of the machine, I showed a, a jumpers and switches connected to a D connector that normally goes to the console. I don't have the console, but on the console there are a couple of, couple of reader control switches. One just seems to control the power to the reader, um, but this one seems to be a logic control that um, pauses or disables the ability of the PDP to generate step pulses. Uh, so what we'll do now is we'll try and manually trigger this. The scope is set up to show pulses on the step input to the reader. Just bear in mind this little board is simulating a reader. The first LED is on when it's waiting for the first step pulse and it will stay on until the entire first block of 191 bytes has been read. The next LED will come on when it starts reading the or sending the next block of data and um, so forth so it will keep going until it's sent all the data but it won't start sending once I trigger the PDP through the terminal until in theory I flick this switch over. So as ever I'll bring the terminal up in the corner of the screen and uh, I'll just go and enter the uh, required values if you recall I have to set the stack pointer and the base address for the code uh, and then we'll come back and toggle the switch and in theory we should see the system come to life and start trying to read the tape. Okay, so as you can see in the terminal, I have the PDP sitting in the loop waiting to accept data from the tape reader. And as soon as I um, change the pulse switch and toggle it to on, we should see pulses start to appear on the scope. And after a second or two, we should see the LEDs start to change state as the data is transferred into the PDP. So I'll toggle the switch now. We can see the pulses on the scope, we can see the LEDs progressing as the blocks of code change and uh, we can also see now on the terminal that it's actually booted into the CNC code. So in other words what we've done here is we've effectively loaded the contents that were on the paper tape that the owner got with the machine um, into the PDP. Now, because I've done this manually and I've entered sort of random values for the addresses, it almost certainly won't do what it's supposed to. Um, so the next step is to figure out uh, how to trigger the tape reader from within the uh, CNC software itself or figure out how it's supposed to be used. Um, but hopefully this makes it clear that the reader interface is working. It's able to read tape, the bootloader loaded up. Um, control was handed to the bootloader and then it went through and loaded the rest of the data. Uh, so this is kind of a good technique if you want to uh, try and figure out if something's working. In this case it's easier doing this than using the uh, physical tape reader. Uh, apart from anything else we don't want to start damaging tapes um, and this allows us to change the code and put in uh, various status indications such as the LEDs to show us um, how it's progressing through the various steps and if it does fail uh, we can track down exactly where it failed. Um, okay so that's it for this video as I said before if you want to see more of this type of um, in-depth information then let me know if you want even more detail leave a comment um, but hopefully you found this uh, video interesting.